Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Voodoo Garden. My name is Ray. I will be your host today. I'm getting rid of some plants, and uh, yeah, that's never a popular thing with my viewers, but it's a necessary thing, so I do it anyway. Um, I'm cutting some of the plants up, and I'm putting them in my compost pile outside, and, but some of the plants I'm going to feed to my goats. Yeah, <laughs> I'm actually growing my own goat food in here. This is an agave. And I mentioned what an agave is. Uh, they grow it for uh, some kind of sugary sap, and they, I think they make uh, some kind of liquor out of it. But anyway, I'm going to take this thing out of the pot because I need the pot, I need the dirt, I need the space in the voodoo garden, and I already have another one growing way back there in the corner that is a lot bigger than this. And I don't need two of them. I only grew two to make sure that one of them survived. So I'm going to chop this one up, pull it up, and I'm just dying to see what the roots look like because they're growing so well. I want to know what the roots look like in these, and that way it'll help educate me as to what this plant is all about. Sometimes we have to crack a few eggs in order to make an omelet, and uh, I, uh, I know it sounds really weird, but sometimes I'll take these plants apart because I want to know how they work, and uh, this uh, it fascinates me. Uh, so I want to take this plant out of here, look at the root structure, and see, because maybe this plant needs a, a bigger pot. Maybe it has deeper roots. I don't know. I've never grown this before. I have no idea what's going on underneath this soil. So uh, I'm going to take this out of the soil and uh, take a look at it, and it'll help me when I'm growing that one. Also, my Christmas cactus, also known as holiday cactus, it flowered. <laughs> it flowered for Halloween. Uh, yeah, this thing has no sense of rhyme or reason. I think in nature they... They have a certain time period where they flower, but in uh, in a grow room situation, they really don't know what time of year it is, so they just start flowering all over the place. But I grew this from a few little cuttings many, many years ago, and it grew really huge. I cut it back. It's growing big again, but I don't want to grow this anymore. I know that sounds weird, and some people are like, oh, no, you really should grow it. But like I said, it's tough love, and some people don't like it. Some people do like it, but I have to do what's best for me and what's best for the voodoo garden. I'm going to take a couple cuttings off of this and start it in a smaller pot and start back from zero. Because for me, it's not actually getting to the finish line. It's the, the, the journey. And for me, starting out really small and then growing really big, that was the fun part. I've seen how big this thing can get. All right, I, I, I got there. I want to play the game over again. So I'm going to take this apart. I'm going to look at the root structure. I'm going to take a few cuttings, and I'm going to put it up here on the shelf. That's going to free up some floor space for when those ones up there, the peppers and tomatoes, remember those ones in the little cups and everything? Um, I want to make sure that they have enough room because eventually they're coming down from there, and they're coming down here. So it does actually have a reason. Now, I also have one big monster over here that I'm just kind of crawling all over the floor like a big baby. But um, this thing here... Come on over here. Don't be shy. Ugh. Say goodbye, folks. Ugh. Say goodbye to this. This is my Zabrina or blood banana, and uh, I, I have to get rid of it because, I, and it's really kind of weird. It's kind of a Genesis type of thing. In order for, uh, and for you Star Wars fans, I, uh, I got to do this. <laughs> if you kill me, I will come back even stronger than you can imagine. That's what this thing does. I sliced it off down at ground level, uh, I think it was a couple years ago, and it grew back. Yeah, this is actually not the original banana plant. It grew back, and then it had a pup, which is a baby, and I think that thing died. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that thing died, and now it's having another pup. Yeah, but I need to get rid of this thing because it shades everything in the voodoo garden. All these lights are for nothing because this thing has taken up, I think, eight lights. Eight lights, and that just, no, you can't do, no, you can't do that. And it's already hit the ceiling with one leaf, and the leaf went over, and the other leaf is going to hit the ceiling. This thing has reached the limit of what it can do in the voodoo garden, except produce fruit. But since I'm just cutting it back, it still has the mature root system, so it's going to continue to grow. And I'm going to show you this in stages as it goes. So you're going to see me as I slice it down, and I know this doesn't look fun, but it's a necessary part of doing your garden. It's kind of like pruning your peppers. Uh, back. It doesn't look fun. Uh, it's hard to do, but once you do it, you realize that it was a good thing that you did. So, come on over here, folks. It's, it's only going to hurt once, but it's going to be for the best. And I want you to see what this thing looks like up close as it grows, because this may encourage you if you ever need to do it in your house. Oh, wow, these things are decomposing right in the soil. It might help you uh, when you're growing your stuff. Come on over. Isn't that cute? Yep. 
a brand new banana plant grows out of the bottom. This is a common thing when your bananas get mature, they will start, and they get crowded in their pot, they will start putting out new babies at the bottom. So you have a choice. You can either get, let these things grow just a little bit more and then separate them from the parent. And I believe that's a matter of slicing down between these gently with a knife and then getting these things out with a little bit of root and putting them into a new pot. I think that's how it works. Now, there is a channel called Plants and Things, and uh, uh, this guy, he grows this stuff all day long, and he knows more about it than I do. So I've never actually done it, but I watched him do it, and it fascinated me. But I'm not going to be separating this. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to slice this off, let this one grow, and let this one grow. I figure, what the heck? Let's just have two of them. I've grown one, and I've grown them twice. Look at the thickness on this thing, though. It's thicker than my wrist, and I got an average size wrist. Yeah, this thing is really, really thick, and it's sturdy as all heck. It grew really well in this soil inside, and when I got it, it was a little more than this size. It was just about maybe this tall. It was this itty bitty slip of a thing. I bought it from a seller on eBay, and uh, they are beautiful, beautiful plants, and they take very little care at all. But anyway, let's get down to business. What I'm going to do is just gently. I know, but uh, I, I want to make sure that there's a clean cut. Now, once you slice this, it's going to have a lot of sap coming up, but that's okay. I don't use anything to seal it up. It'll eventually heal itself, all right? So now what we're going to do is we're going to slice. I use a very sharp knife, and I just go around here like this, and I hold it steady so it doesn't just fall over and rip. You want to make sure that you're holding it steady, and you go through it. Don't hit the baby. There we go. Easy peasy, folks. Ooh, wow, look. It got brighter in here, didn't it? <laughs> yes, it did. Look at that thing drip. Banana juice. Yep. Well, that thing is dripping all over the place, isn't it? Yeah, there's a lot of juice in there. Did you know? I, you probably did, but I'll tell you anyway. Every part of the banana plant, from the roots, to the stem, to the leaves, to the banana, to the banana peels, every part of it is edible and non-poisonous. Yep. And uh, so this is not a total waste. I mean, I'm not just throwing this plant away. This entire plant, from trunk to leaves, I'm feeding it to the goats. I researched it online. It's perfectly safe to uh, feed to goats. Yeah, you can use banana leaves for cooking, but I don't need them. I want to feed them to my goats. I love my animals, I care for my animals, and this is something that they're going to just love. It's, it's almost winter time out there, there's nothing else to eat out there, everything's died. They're going to love this, something a little bit tropical for my furry babies outside. I can't believe how bright it is in here. It has not been this bright in months. Wow. Smells like bananas in here. I know, you're, you're thinking, oh, well, duh, right, of course. But come on, how often do I get to sniff a banana stem? Not very often at all. This thing's just dripping like crazy. I'm just going to let it water itself for a while. So, uh, oh, wait a minute. I think it's done. Okay, well, problem solved. Let's set you off to the side. Now, I'm going to show you in upcoming episodes how this banana tree comes back from, well, supposedly from the dead, but this is actually a good thing to do. This banana tree is going to get better and better. It's going to just continue to, to grow and thrive in the voodoo garden. So this is not the end of the banana tree. It's just a change in the banana tree. Okay, keep that in mind. I didn't kill it. I'm actually helping it out in the long run. Ooh, 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 ooh. I have a few questions. Uh, uh, people posted, I, I asked you for questions. I know I'm just kind of going crazy today, but I'm kind of been, uh, going nuts. Um, I asked you for questions and people went crazy. They took me serious. <laughs> <laughs> and they started <laughs> typing questions all over the place. So I'm going to do a little bit of stuff around here, but I'm also going to uh, answer your questions today because it's important that you get answers to your questions. You don't post them just to see yourself type. I'm going to go through these really quick and give you the answers uh, right off the top of my head. Okay, first one, Susan Alexander posted a question. Hi, Ray. I love your channel. Thank you, Susan. Um, Hi, Ray. I love your channel. My peace lily is wilting, and I don't know why. What do you think? Um, Susan, uh, somebody actually asked me a question about a peace lily. I, I believe they're called Spathilium or something like that. I used to know all the names to these. I knew all the Latin names to all these indoor plants because the one thing you may not know, I, I think I mentioned it once, I used to own an indoor foliage plant store. Yeah, in Denver. It was called Gumby's Garden. And um, I owned this for a while in, in uh, Denver. 
and uh, it was fun. It was fun. Uh, I uh, just I was surrounded by greenery. I mean, it was the dream job for me. I would sell plants to people, talk to people all day long. I loved it. But I learned all the Latin names for these. But the common name is peace lily. A lot of you have seen these things in office buildings and stuff. They're very graceful, beautiful plants. You normally see them in a large pot. They got a stem and they got a big leaf at the top, stem, big leaf, and they're a beautiful dark green, like an emerald green. And then right in the center, you'll see a stem coming up and this white flower. You know what I'm talking about, the white flower? That's called a peace lily. And peace lilies are very easy to grow. And the reason that they're so popular is because you don't have to have full sun or bright light. They actually thrive in shade. So that way, indoors, anywhere you want to place them indoors, they're going to do just fine. But there is one trick that you need to learn, and a lot of people don't know this about peace lilies. People get the information that they're moisture-loving plants. Well, they are mo moisture-loving plants, but there is a trick to this. They don't like to have their roots wet. You may, you may be thinking, well, that doesn't make sense. Well, actually it does. Peace lilies love growing in well-drained, rich soil. Now there, there's the key, all right, Susan, and everybody else that wants to try this. It has to be well-drained soil. You can't just use regular potting mix. That's not gonna work. You put in regular potting mix and then you grow a peace lily and you give it all kinds of water, that's gonna kill it. And that's why a lot of these will wilt. People think, well, it's not getting enough water. They pour on more water. Well, it wilts even more and they pour on more water because they think it needs more water. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't need more water. And then some people will not water it and let it dry out. Well, if you let a piece of lily dry out, you're gonna kill it because it doesn't like to be dry. So, you, you know, you're, you're thinking right now, okay, well, that's just too difficult. No, it's actually very, very simple. And let me explain how. Get yourself some potting soil, whatever kind you want to use, and get yourself some vermiculite. You can use perlite or vermiculite. I prefer using vermiculite because uh, it just seems to work the best for me. Vermiculite takes water, holds water, but it also drains it away. It's kind of like a sponge, but it's a natural sponge. It's a mined mineral, and no, there is no asbestos in it. Some people think that a vermiculite has asbestos in it. Well, it doesn't. There was only one mine that had asbestos in the vermiculite. It was the Libby mine, and I think it was in Idaho or Iowa. Oh, no, not Iowa. <laughs> Idaho or somewhere over there, but they don't do that anymore, okay? So vermiculite is 100% perfectly safe to use, and I suggest using the larger vermiculite. It comes in different grades, fine, medium, and coarse. The coarser, the better, all right? Take your uh, potting soil, mix it up about maybe one-third vermiculite and two-thirds rich potting soil. That seems like a lot of vermiculite, but what it's going to do is it's going to lighten up that soil, allow those roots to get down in there really quick, air them out, and that way the vermiculite will help keep them moist, the soil will keep it rich, and it will keep it well drained and keep the oxygen in there, and that's very important for peace lilies, okay? So whenever you water them, water them well, but let them almost dry out, but not quite, and then repeat the process, and that's all there is to it. And, and as the plant grows, the outer leaves will die off. This is natural, okay? Snip those leaves off close to the main trunk of the plant, the main cluster, there is no trunk. Uh, Cut them off to where they're only about that, that long, the nubs, get rid of them, and eventually it's gonna flower. When it's done flowering and the flower starts looking like crap, get that thing out of there, it'll continue to grow. That's all you need to know about growing peace lilies. Next one, from a Mohan, oh, here we go. Ray's gonna mess up your name. Mohan Udiavar. I don't know, did I mess that one up? Mohan, I'll just call you Mohan. Mohan asks, could perlite be a better option to vermiculite? Oh, that kind of blends into the last question. Um, vermiculite and uh, perlite are both mined minerals from the earth, okay? And uh, perlite, in a nutshell, uh, layman's terms, is nothing more than rock popcorn. They take this uh, mineral and they superheat it to like over a thousand degrees and it goes and it pops like popcorn. Yeah, that's exactly what perlite is. And it's not to be confused with, uh, 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 what is that stuff, the insulation, that white granular insulation? No, it's not that at all, okay? It's not styrofoam. That, or you can use vermiculite. And vermiculite, I think it's uh, uh, vermiculi means worm. I think it means worm in Latin or something like that. And that's because the, the mineral, when you heat it up, it's actually, it looks like a worm and then they break it up into little tiny pieces. It's kind of like those snakes that we used to play with when we were kids, you'd light them on fire on, on the 4th of July and they go shh. Well, that's similar to what vermiculite is, but um, it's a natural mineral. It's 
just fine. It's not going to change the pH. None of these change the pH to your soil. They don't mess with anything. They're perfectly good. But there was something about vermiculite that I liked. And it was a long time ago. And I don't forget what I read about it. But I like using that a lot better. So my, my preference is vermiculite. If you can get vermiculite, coarse vermiculite, you got something good there. All right, next one from Zach Olson. Hey, Zach. Um, how do you water all of your plants? I'm starting pots of tomatoes, and it takes quite a while to fill, fill mixed newts, <laughs> mixed newts, dude, and uh, water. Any tips? Well, uh, Zach, if you're going to be growing stuff indoors, you're going to have to spend some time with it. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the main concerns that uh, some people will have when they're growing uh, gardens and they have a, an actual life outside of this is, uh, you know, it just takes so much time. Well, for me, gardening is not something, it's not an afterthought. Gardening is something that I enjoy doing, so I take my time to do it. I don't rush anything. There are no shortcuts in what I do. What I do is the long route. Some other gardeners will give you shortcuts on how to get there. I don't give you shortcuts. That's just not my style. That's the wrong channel. I give you the nice, easy way to do things. Some things are a little bit uh, quicker. Some things are a, lo a little bit easier, but they're not shortcuts. For me, I just take a bucket, five gallon bucket. I take my organic fertilizer. Okay, wrong bucket. Uh, <laughs> I take my bucket, I take my organic fertilizer, and I've used different organic fertilizers throughout the years. I used to mix my own out of all kinds of different stuff, and that was fun. Now, I'm using this stuff called Organic BioLink. And uh, first of all, it's a wonderful product. Second of all, the company is, their, their head is full of air. I tried to talk to one of the representatives, and I'm scared of anybody who runs an organic company, and I know more than they do. You know, I shouldn't know more than you do about your own product. But anyway, it stinks like a butt, but it works. You know, it's organic. So it's not supposed to smell good. You throw in eight ounces. I never measure. I don't do that when I'm cooking. I don't do that when I'm gardening. You throw in eight ounces. Oh, and it smells like, oh, yeah, I already told you what it smells like. Yeah, well, add the smell of vinegar to that smell. And there you have organic fertilizer. It doesn't smell good, but then again, the plants aren't, they don't have noses, they don't care, and a lot of the, of the organic fertilizers that you're going to buy, they're going to have like pulverized fish, they're going to have all kinds of like manures, they're going to have hydrolyzed this and that. It's going to reek, you know? Nature is a weird cannibalistic thing, and it's not pretty when you're looking at it, okay? Nature is basically life from death. All right, things have to die for things to live in nature. That's just the way life works, okay? Things die, they decompose in the soil, and then the plants live off of that. That's how it works. So when you see things that are dead, like pulverized fish in your fertilizer, don't gross out. That's nature in action, okay? These, these aren't nice, happy little fish that were swimming along that mankind decided to run through a meat grinder. These are parts, you know, from the industry and stuff. The tails, the gills, you know, the eyelids, all kinds of weird stuff. What's nice about this organic biolink, by the way, is if you're a vegan, vegetarian, uh, uh, nature-oriented, you want to save the environment, I'm not a spokesman for this company. I'm just a customer from this company, okay? So I, you know, I'm not uh, promoting them, but they use three ingredients in this, and I want to mention this because it's actually very impressive. Uh, it's a 333, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, 333. It's a very mild fertilizer, but that's what you want. You don't want to jack it up. You don't need anything that's really high numbers. That's not necessary when you're gardening, okay? That's just showing off. Uh, low numbers are just fine because this is good for everyday feeding, and you don't have to worry about, well, when do I feed and how much do I feed? I use this every time I water. I actually fill this up with water, and I use this every time I water my plants. That way I don't have to worry about, well, did I fertilize that? Did I fertilize that? No, it's a constant feeding. This thing uses soybeans, it uses hydrolyzed soy protein, rock phosphate, it's mined, and potassium sulfate, that's mined. That's it, three ingredients, that's all it has. So uh, it doesn't use any animal parts, anything like that. It's uh, stuff that's mined from the ground, it's soybeans and stuff, and boy does it stink. And um, anyway, I add eight ounces, fill up a five gallon bucket, I take my little Barbie doll watering can, that little tacky looking thing and I just start watering my plants. That's how I do it. I don't, I don't, uh, apparently you must have a different kind of fertilizer if you just mix it up and use it each time. I, I mix mine up and this lasts me about a week. So only one time do I do that and every day when I come downstairs, 
I do this on purpose. I actually take my time, look at my plants, talk to them, snip off a leaf here and there, kind of like a bonsai gardener would. I, uh, this is how I recharge and this is how I live my life. It isn't something that I try to rush through. So I'm sorry. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing for you to rush through. I'm just saying that I don't have a way for you to rush through your, your gardening. You know, I appreciate your question, but I guess I'm just going to have to chalk this one up to I can't answer it because I just, that's not how I work things. And I'm sure there's people that uh, watch this program that they have ideas as well. So maybe they'll post something to your question. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> I demonstrated the fertilizer. Now I have to smell it. Let me go put this away. Okay. <laughs> Ray stung up the joint. Okay, next one. Mr. Vegetable Lover asks, what inspired you to start growing? Um, what inspired me? I think fascination. It wasn't any particular person. It wasn't any particular thing. It was fascination with life. I am fascinated by how life works. I, I read it somewhere that, you know, the only reason we exist is six inches of fertile soil on the earth and the fact that it rains. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't even be here. And uh, that is incredible how delicate life is and how easily it could be gone and how short our life is. I mean, we only live, uh, you know, for lucky, maybe a hundred years. And when you think about that in the scheme of things and the whole existence of everything, that is the briefest fraction of the blink of an eye. And so it fascinates me the way things grow, you know? Uh, we live our lives in a rush, you know? We're always trying to get somewhere. And we're always trying to do something. We're always trying to do this. We're always trying to do that. Whereas plants, they don't do that, you know? They just go about their life. They don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. They don't know what happened yesterday. They're just having a good time. <laughs> that sounds ridiculous, but they do. And they go at their own speed and they don't care what you think. And they don't care what you do. They're going to do their own thing and they're going to do it in their own way. Each plant has their own particular dance and they do it their own particular way. And I love that. So uh, that kind of thing always fascinated me to watch things grow, to watch how things produce, reproduce, and how they uh, respond to care. That's what got me into growing and that's why I can't stop. I can, I can never stop this because the fascination just keeps going. I do the same thing over and over, but each time I, I would do it like well, I'm planting my peppers and tomatoes for next year already. I'm already planting them in the, in the voodoo garden. But when they came up out of the ground, I still got that same joy that we get when we see our, our stuff germinating. I was excited. I wanted to tell people. I wanted to show people. And I did. I took pictures and I'm uh, slamming them all over my face. Like, hey, look at this. And um, that's what I do. I'm just fascinated. That's what got me into it. That's what keeps me going into it. And that's what's going to keep me going until I can no longer lift myself up and hold a water can. I am definitely going to be a gardener until the day I die. It's just in my blood. It's who I am. Okay. Um, Dan, just Dan asks, can you top tomatoes like your pepper plant for a stockier plant that doesn't need support? And do you have a video on this? Um, well, that's kind of a two part question. Can you top tomatoes like your pepper plants? Absolutely. Uh, does it make them stockier? Absolutely. That's the reason I do it. It makes them stockier and it also promotes uh, lower suckering to come out for a lower center of gravity. And also when I plant them outside, I bury them deeper. I'm going to be demonstrating this throughout the, the winter in the voodoo garden, how I promote the lower suckers and how I get a sturdier plant. But once they go outside, I bury them deeper and I bury those low suckers underneath the ground. So the practice method that I, I, I practice here is a two-part thing. I plant them deeper and I bury them as they grow, the peppers and tomatoes. Not so much the peppers, but more the tomatoes. And that promotes extra root growth. And then when I take them outside, the lower suckers go out to the side. I bury those so we got a vertical depth and a lateral bearing of the stems. And that produces more roots and more roots means more production. And more production, happier rate. But um, as far as stockiness, you're never going to get a really super stocky, self-supporting tomato plant. It just doesn't happen. And uh, it's, it's, it's green 
matter and it doesn't get really woody like a, a pepper plant or a tree or anything like that, tomatoes are always going to need support. Unless you have a patio tomato and you don't have any wind, tomatoes are always going to need support. The reason that I prune them back is to make the, them, the stems thicker to feed the plant more. A bigger, fatter stem is going to let more nutrients get through to the plant and uh, it's going to feed the plant a little bit better. For pepper plants though, they develop more of a woody stem. So when I prune them back, it's also to produce side a suckering side growth, but it's also to make them self-supporting and sturdy. So my pepper plants are actually quite amazing. And I've grown them like you've, like you've seen, like four to five feet across, up to seven feet tall, totally self-supporting, not a stick of anything holding them up. And that is what the pruning does. It helps, it helps them be sturdier, it helps them with the production, but you can't do with tomatoes what you do with peppers. All right, and um, do I have a video on this? Well, <laughs> no. I have uh, little snippets here and there because my whole uh, YouTube experience is a journey. So it's not like, uh, here's how you grow pepper from start to finish. I don't have anything like that, no. Uh, you just have to, go back and start watching my stuff and just take your time and eventually you'll catch up to the modern ones that are right now and you'll understand you'll be like oh it's a journey okay i'm not trying to teach anybody a one-shot thing and then you're on your way for me it's i bring my friends in you and everybody else and we go through this together and you learn something i learn something we all learn something and we have a good time along the, the way so there is no particular uh program on it no Next question is from Steph23. Hi, Steph. Uh, I have an avocado plant growing indoors in a plastic pot with nice long stem and beautiful light green leaves. I notice that the older leaves are turning black at the end, then completely black in, until it falls off. Some new leaves are still growing, but I do not know why the others are kind of dying. Is that normal or something else I have to be concerned about? Well, um, I've grown avocado plants quite a bit. My grandma grew them and that's what got me growing them because you know every Mexican grandmother has an avocado plant growing in her house. I know it sounds strange, but it's true. Anybody that, that has a Mexican grandma, you know they got an avocado plant growing in their kitchen. It's just a weird thing. But um, no, avocado plants, uh, they don't like to have their roots remaining wet. Oh, they hate that. They hate keyword being hate. Avocado plants need to have their roots dry out. They do. And they and they will show you. Their leaves will start turning black around the edges and there and there's two reasons this will happen. One is that uh, the roots are remaining moist way too much because the roots go down fast. They put out that taproot in the lower roots, not so much the upper roots, but lower roots. So you're watering along and you're doing just fine. The top starts to dry out a little bit and then you water it, but you forget this pot is deeper than what you're seeing on the top. So the bottom is still moist. This avocado still has moisture down here. You're adding more moisture to moisten the top and that moisture goes down and it keeps this wet at the bottom. That is the biggest mistake people make when, a lot, when they're watering a lot of plants, but especially the water sensitive plants like the avocados. Avocados will not respond favorably and that's why you're gonna see these leaves just crinkling up and turning brown. You don't know what, what happens. Lay off the water lay off the water, okay? And also over fertilizing. They don't like a lot of fertilizers and when it comes to artificial fertilizers, those salts that are in the artificial fertilizers, they affect avocados more so than some other plants. They just don't like it. They'll grow with it and I've tried using artificial fertilizers ages and ages ago and I had the worst luck. The best luck I've ever had is a mild organic fertilizer and letting the plant dry out. If you want to water your plant successfully for an avocado, water from the bottom up. Don't worry about the top. It doesn't need water on the top. It needs water on the bottom. That way if you just water a little bit on the bottom and then let it dry out, you don't have to worry about watering from the top. Just a little bit on the bottom, let it dry out. And if you think you need to water it, give it a couple more days because more than likely it's still moist, okay? Feel your pot. When I water my plants, I wait until they're bone dry and I pick them up, I go, okay, that's what it feels like to me. And then I water them. And then when I pick them up again, I tip them like this. I can actually feel when they need water. And I'm not a genius or anything, it's just that I pay attention to my plants. So if you pay attention to your plants, you're gonna know. It's like a kid. You know when your kid's hungry. Kid doesn't have to tell you, you can just tell. And um, with your plants, you can actually tell if you pay attention to the soil. This isn't something that I'm gonna promote as, you know, um, uh, absentee gardening. 
you know, uh, what I promote is getting to know your plants and you're going to have a lot better luck with it. So anyway, yes, pay attention to the water. Okay, Steph? Um, last one, Raging Gamer LOL. <laughs> I love that name when I was typing it out. Raging Gamer LOL says, hey, Ray. Hey, Raging Gamer. Have you ever done a propagation video? Yeah, I've done a bunch. Yeah. Uh, I ended up getting an apple cutting. Oh, apple cuttings. I ended up getting an apple cutting, and for now, I just stuck it in a jar of water with nothing else added. I've just seen videos saying to put a root hormone on the base and stick it in the dirt and water. Well, yeah, I guess you could do that. I tried rooting a, 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 a piece of an apple tree, and I put it into vermiculite because that will keep it moist, but it also keeps the oxygen in there because if you just throw it in water, you know, I don't, I don't, that does work sometimes, but sometimes it's, you know, people don't change the water. So I don't promote that because people are going to be like, well, I tried it your way and I'm, and I'll ask them, did you change the water? Uh, no. Well, you got to change the water because water gets stale and uh, the oxygen in the water goes away and it starts looking all really uh, awful. Like when you're doing an avocado pit, when you're starting it in the water with the toothpicks and stuff, you got to change that water every few days. Rinse off the avocado pit. That is the key to getting those avocado pits to actually crack open and send up a shoot. You got to keep changing that water. Oxygenated water is the key. So the rooting hormone will work. I don't use rooting hormone, but yes, it absolutely does work. Um, my my uh, uh, advice would be take your cutting Take a clean cutting too. Take it below one of the nodes of the, the uh, apple branch. Take it a clean cutting at a 45 degree angle. I just like it that way. I don't know. I just prefer it that way. Take a really clean cut, not with scissors, but with a sharp knife. Get it into rooting hormone instantly. Just tap, tap, tap. Put it into vermiculite or extremely well drained potting mix. Vermiculite's the best because it's sterile, pretty much. It's not going to have all of the microbes eating away at the stem. And you hit the rooting hormone, stick it in the uh, moist uh, vermiculite, and keep it out of direct sun. This thing doesn't have roots. It's not growing. It's rooting. There's a difference between growing and rooting. Okay? So you want it to root before it grows. So put it in deflected sunlight in like bright shade in your house and leave it there for probably a few weeks and let it root first, okay? And take off all but the upper leaves because it has to support those leaves and it can't do that with no roots. It's hard to do. So the more leaves you take off, the better. That's my advice to you and that pretty much wraps it up for questions. Yeah, it was really quick, wasn't it? I wanted to make sure I got through these really, really fast because I didn't want to just go on and on and on with questions because as much as I like answering them, I know some people don't want to sit there and just listen to all that gap. Uh, it stinks in here. I had to clip the video and get that bucket away from me. It just reeked. But anyway, thank you everybody for joining me on the Voodoo Garden. I think that pretty much wraps it up. If you have any questions concerning your indoor garden or indoor gardening needs, post it in the comment section below this video and I will be sure to answer your question as quickly and as best as I possibly can. And um, until next time, this is Ray in the Voodoo Garden. I'm out of here. Okay, <sighs> time to feed the goats. <laughs> Don't you just love it? Yep, it's bananas today, Mr. Goat. Hey, get out of my way. Come on.